Um, so today I'm going to talk. I'm going to split up my talk into essentially three sections that are that I think will be meaningful. One, quick introduction about what we're doing with Cisco Intercloud Services. I'm going to keep the PowerPoint uh, hopefully to a minimum. I got about 10 to 12 slides that are, uh, you know, the the talk, and then I'm going to go into some slides that go over. Uh, the code that we're actually going to deploy. Um, then we're going to we're going to talk and, and, uh, in between. I should say we're going to talk about the different ways you can interact with our cloud platform. If you look at what is the intercloud, uh, we're essentially networking a bunch of our a bunch of clouds together. So, as you may or may not know, we have a Cisco uh, Cisco powered program, and for that we have. Uh, you know, around 175 to 200 uh, Cisco powered partners. So they're Cisco validated designs and uh, they're, they're, they're part of our ecosystem. In addition, uh, we also want to connect our enterprise private clouds. That's obvi obviously very important to many of our enterprises that may want to consume services with our Cisco powered cloud providers or with Cisco intercloud services, which is the box in the, box in the orange. Now, if we if we look at why you know what's the value to the to the inner cloud program, the first one is choice. You have the ability to deploy cloud infrastructures uh, in in a multitude of ways. I, I already mentioned with our inner cloud providers, enterprise private cloud, as well as inner cloud services. Uh, the other thing that you get out of this is uh, compliance. So. It's important to a lot of our customers because data sovereignty laws are no joke. In some countries, it's very important that you don't take workloads or data uh, out, out of country. Uh, so you'll see later on in the talk, I'll show you where we're live with, where we're live and where we're going to be live in the, in the short term uh, with Cisco Intercloud Services. And you can see how we're, we're kind of uh, attacking, attacking that potential problem. The other one is control. It's very important to our customers that we have control of cloud resources uh, as they're on the intercloud. Um, this also falls a little bit into compliance because for security reasons, uh, our, our customers certainly certainly want to, uh, want to ensure that they have secure workloads in our cloud. Some of the key characteristics of Cisco intercloud services, our platform, is that it, it is a self-service public cloud platform with that said, we're offering a wider range of services on top of our cloud, and I'll, I'll get into that in, in, in a little bit. The next point that I think is worth mentioning is that it is based on open standards. So as you probably know, as you probably know how many of you have heard of OpenStack? Okay, so there's a, there's a heavy investment from Cisco uh, in OpenStack uh, as far as development, as far as validated, you know, validated designs and architectures, and we've also embraced it heavily uh, with, within Cisco, in, with Cisco Intercloud Services. Next one is global scale. The ability to, work, to move those workloads uh, potentially between Cisco Intercloud Services sites or to hybrid, or you know, in hybrid scenarios to uh, other cloud partners and that type of thing. Next one is APIs. This is an important one, especially we're in DevNet. We want to empower, we want to empower developers to build Cloud native applications. Uh, if you look at if you look at a lot of the the clouds that are out there today, a lot of them uh, outside of the you know outside of the you know the typical big big five ten, a lot of them uh, don't have a heavy focus on exposing APIs, which means they they're essentially infrastructure as a service type plays uh, without the without some ability to interact with the system. The last point is rapid innovation. So we built the, the cloud platform to be a place for rapid innovation. Now you're you're going to um, the flexibility that it gives our partners. It gives our partners the ability to build their their solutions in their data center, and these are our cloud provider partners. Uh, they can build their platforms inside their data center, but they can also leverage the platform that we're building. Uh, to push those cloud native apps uh, into you know, into Cisco Inner Cloud Services. Next point, you know, I talked about data sovereignty and 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 its importance. You can see that we have a, a number of different locations on the slide here. 
we are already we already up in production with workloads in a number of these locations. Some of the locations are, are coming in the future, uh, but you can see that we're building across the globe. Uh, for, a, for a program that's you know, about a year, year and a couple months old, uh, we've definitely made, uh, definitely, definitely made a big impact globally. If you look at the overall services framework, uh, the best, best way to think about it, we have our platform, which is the Cisco Core, Core InterCloud Service, bleh, the Cisco InterCloud Services platform, which is, again, based on OpenStack and a number of other Cisco technologies and non-Cisco technologies. And then we offer some advanced platform services. And then on top of that, it, I'm sure you've heard of Marketplace. There's been a lot of buzz about Marketplace. The marketplace is that is that place that allows our ISVs and our partners to offer services as well on top of Cisco InterCloud. Uh, the enhanced platform services, uh, just the, the thing that's worth mentioning, we're talking about virtualized network functions, we're talking about big data uh, analytics. Uh, if you were here uh, about an hour ago, Karthik, one of my colleagues, uh, spent a lot of time talking about uh, Hadoop as a service and, and what we're doing with that. But it's really important, we're targeting to be the, the platform for the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything. The next thing I'm going to talk about is interaction. And this comes down to how, develop, how developers can potentially interact with the platform. Now, this is, you don't have to be a developer to interact with the platform. It's key to understand that. Uh, but there are services, the services that I'll go through, the first one is API. So within OpenStack, there are a number of API services that are exposed, such as compute, network, storage, block storage, um, object storage, that type of thing. And that's what we'll look at, a, at a, just in just a little bit. But you also have other options to interact if you don't want to just go native with the APIs. You can use different software-defined kits. So if you, if you like... Uh, if you prefer to write your code in Python or you prefer to write your, your code in Ruby, uh, there, there are a number of SDK options that are available uh, to interact with the platform. Another option, which uh, is one that I'll demo al along with uh, uh, what we call Heat, which I'll go into in just a second, uh, is a CLI. So CLI is something that can be automated or non-automated. Uh, you can use it for checks and balances. You can use it to gather information from the system. Uh, but you'll, you'll get the gist if you're not familiar with the OpenStack CLI uh, whenever I go into the demo. This last one, which I think is important, I mentioned you, you don't have to necessarily be a developer to use the platform. Uh, that's certainly, certainly the target, because obviously the goal is to onboard cloud-native applications. But there's also a GUI, and I'll show you the GUI. It's OpenStack Horizon. From that GUI, uh, everything that I show you in the CLI or everything I show you that, that we deploy with, the, with our heat template, all of that can be done via the GUI as well, but it's iterative, clicks, 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 put in data, put in data. Uh, so it's obviously not a, you know, it's not a, it's not an automated, uh, it's not an automated interaction. Guess I'm walking too way too far away with the uh, with the clicker. Um, so as far as the developer platform, uh, I, the the three things I want to talk about within Cisco InterCloud Services. The first one is a heat template. A heat template bas basically allows you to describe a set of services that you'd like to deploy, and then deploy those services. Now that is not just about a VM. That's not just about a router, a virtual router. That's not about. That's not just about a subnet or a port. It's also about deploying an application, uh, and that's what we'll we'll get into. We're going to deploy a couple of applications as as we go in go further. The next thing, uh, how many of you have heard of Project Shift? Great. Um, so, in the last uh, I'll say two months, uh, we've announced Project Shift, which is really a developer platform as a service uh, set of tools. Project Shift gives you the ability to leverage to leverage a PaaS, which, is, which gives you a CI CD pipeline. So for a lot of, for a lot of customers, they're interested in, hey, how, how do I do DevOps? Or how do I get in, how, how can I uh, build this set of automated tools together so that I can 
so that I can deploy, deploy services or microservices. Project Shift is that platform, and I'm not going to go into a demo. If you caught uh, Ken Owen's session yesterday, uh, he, actually, he actually did a pretty nice demo that was, that was uh, well received. And uh, actually, he just, uh, if you follow him, follow him on Twitter or LinkedIn, he posted a slide, so definitely, definitely check it out. The last one is what I'll call uh, develop, you know, not developer platform, but platform as a service. Now this is where OpenShift and Cloud Foundry and that type of thing come in. A lot of our customers are at the point where they're exploring with Cloud Foundry or OpenShift. Some have made commitments, some are, some are embracing, some are developing, which is great. It's all great news. As, as it pertains to Cisco InterCloud Services, what, what, our, what these customers are doing right now is they're bringing their own and they're running, those, running that in tenant space. Now, that's, that's somewhat interesting, but the goal at the end of the day is to abstract, abstract the underlying infrastructure. Uh, so what we'll be doing is offering, uh, what I'll say, true platform as a service uh, in, in, a, in a managed manner within Cisco InterCloud Services. So that's a little bit of a future, but it doesn't stop you from getting started today. Uh, in your, in, you know, in your own project or, or your own environment. The last part uh, is where we'll, we'll spend a spend a bulk of our time is around the demo. So I'll start with a little bit of an overview on the demo. So what are we deploying? We're going to deploy some resources with heat, instances, ports, networks, and routers. Ports connect instances to networks. Easiest way to think about it. Uh, interfaces connect those networks to routers. Makes sense. Applications, so as far as the applications go, we're gonna de actually deploy two applications. One is a simple web, web app, and then that second one uh, is a web app that's written in Python that uses a Flask framework, and this is essentially a, a microblogging application. I'm not gonna I'm not going to start blogging or anything like that, but I'll, I'm going to start it up. I'll show you. I'll register, and you can you can see how quick and easy it is to to spin up uh, that application. What's what's key to note? It's essentially has nginx as a front end, and uh, it, that's used as a reverse proxy to expose to expose the web application. Now, can you can you guys actually see the uh, no? Okay. So I'll just kind of jump through here. Is this, is this better? Oh, really? Is that better? Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just kind of I'll kind of go through this. Let's see. So you can see this first part. Within this first part, you can see that we're creating some networks and subnets. They're called what I've named them: Flasky subnet, Flasky network. This is simply a network and a subnet for that Flask application that I mentioned before. Uh, right below that, you're going to see a general web app network. And that network is for, for, that, for that other application I mentioned that, that will be uh, just a very simple web app. And that's, that's everything that's covered from general web network, general web subnet. What you can see in here is that we've, these are, there are types. Within, tight, within the network subcomponent of OpenStack, these are essentially neutron, uh, neutron networks, neutron subnets. You can see that we uh, identify what the, what, the, what the actual subnet is in CIDR notation. Uh, and then what you can also see is that down here, we have some parameters. So network ID, we're saying get resource general web network. So that, that, that is essentially a call to general web network. The last part is where we're actually deploying a neutron router. 
So for this, we're just calling a heat router 01. You can see that we also define a gateway. We need a gateway because we're going to, going to enable some floating IP addresses. Uh, and obviously, the, you, you, need, you need logically traffic to get in and out of that router. So that's the, that would be the northbound, northbound direct way out of, the, out of the virtual infrastructure. You can see that down here, we're calling a network ID. This network ID uh, is simply a network that it's the floating IP network or the public network uh, that is in this particular region. You can see that we're calling a UUID, so it's a unique identifier of that network. Uh, let's see. The next set of resources that we call are interfaces. So we need an interface for each network. We have interface zero, uh, which you can see is, is getting, is getting uh, the resource Flasky subnet. And then we have interface one, which you can see is getting the resource General Web 01. Uh, it's also getting the resource that heat router 01 that we also went ahead and created, created earlier on. Now I mentioned you also need ports. Ports connect instances to networks. So here we, we've defined two ports, the Flasky port and the web app port. So that gives your VM the ability to get, connect to the network. The last part is actually the, the floating IP configuration. So here we have, we have two floating IPs, one for the Flask application, one for the general web application. Uh, you can also see, I mentioned that UUID, we're calling that same UUID, and I'll show you a, a visual rep representation in a little bit that is that general public, or I'm sorry, that our public subnet, uh, so our you know, public IP addresses. Now the next set of configuration is actually for the instance. So the instance is the VM. So what do we do with the VM? We're going to spin up a VM. Now you can see, as you can see in here, we have a bunch of, bunch of different things. We have, we're identifying a name, we're identifying the image to use. So as far as image, I'm using, I'm using a Ubuntu uh, trusty 1404 image. You can also see the, diff the flavor. Uh, flavor, we have a bunch of different flavors that we option, uh, that, that we offer, uh, as you would with, uh, with other, you know, obviously other cloud platforms. So we have about 20 different flavors from general purpose to storage optimized, memory optimized, uh, that kind of thing. Now you can also see we reference the port. So we're getting resource Flasky port 01. That's how we're connecting the instance to the network. The last part, we're gonna, we're gonna put in some user data. This user data, so that we can actually go uh, get all of the get all of the dependent dependencies that we may need to spin up that application. So we're going to install packages. We're also going to start those start some of those packages, uh, and all of that's all of that's you know throughout the throughout the code here. The last one is the web app instance. So it's a very similar idea. We have a, a general web app instance. You see the flavor, the image, the name. Now, down here, we're using config drive again. So you can see that, that essentially what we do, we're going to install dependencies. We're going to install Apache. We're going to install Git. And then we're going to clone what we've already, what the, work, the application that we've written in Git. In this example, it's some HTML files and an image. And then obviously once, whoops, once we clone, once we clone that data, then we're going to move those, move those files where they need to be, so they're, ex, so that they're exposed via Ubuntu in the in the www directory. Now we'll jump into the actual demo. All right, 
So first thing, I want to, first thing I'll show you is I mentioned API services that we expose. Uh, if you look in here, you can see what, what, what we do is we monitor all of the, the different services that are exposed from, uh, from our various OpenStack environments. In our example, we're down in Texas. So you can see that we have Cinder, Glance, Neutron, Nova, Swift. So these are our storage network, uh, storage network and, ob and obviously our compute API services. This is what gives us the ability to actually make API calls into the system. So if something isn't working for some reason, we can simply check the, the health page and uh, identify if there may or may not be an issue. Now we'll go ahead and jump into the console. And what we're going to do, uh, so I have a project that's in one of our regions, which is US Texas 1. And we're going to jump into US Texas 1, and I'll, we'll take a look at uh, take a look at our project. Project that we're using is our is a, an environment that I use to deploy different different templated configurations. What I'll call out quickly is that if you go to network topology, you can see that the only thing that's here are the are the networks that are here by default. So these are uh, essentially provider networks that are that are available to all to all tenants that are on the platform. I mentioned that, that floating IP network, that's the blue network that's labeled public floating 601. So as you're assigned a public IP address, it's pulled from that, from that, from that network set. Next thing I'll do, we'll go ahead and actually deploy the template that I was showing you uh, that we just walked through. Now, as you can see, we went ahead and hit stack create now, additionally, you, didn't, you don't have to do this from the CLI. I'm doing it from the CLI just so you, that you can simply see that from this Ubuntu machine, virtual machine that's on my, my laptop here, that you can kick off that, kick off that template. And as you, go back to, as you go back to our environment, you can see that, we've, see that we're spinning up resources now in our network topology. Alternatively, if you didn't want to use the CLI and you simply wanted to load your, your, load your script into uh, the GUI, you could have done it by simply going into the orchestration and then stacks location in, in Horizon, and you could have clicked launch stack, and that, that, that's another way you could have deployed. So you don't necessarily need to be, the, be a CLI, CLI expert, but it's a, it's a useful option. What we can see, if we click on Flasky, which is the name of the stack that I, that I used, you can see all the different resources that we're actually deploying. So you'll see the instances, the ports, the networks, and, and uh, ultimately the, the VMs. So it's going to take a it's just going to take a you know a minute or two for the um, to, for the VMs to spin up. And once the VMs actually spin up and get their you know get the code, then we'll be able to to look at what we've actually deployed. If you go to the resources tab. In the resources tab, you can see all those resources that I that I basically walked you through earlier. You can see that they're all identified here. They all they all they all also have corresponding UUIDs. So you can you can you you, know, you can look and track at what's what's been deployed, what what type of resource it is, uh, and you can also see what the actual state is. So you can see that the Flasky instance, it's still in progress. You know the the. The longest pull in the tent is spinning up the VM, loading the operating system. Uh, cannot, you know, that's that's the way it is. <laughs> now, while that's while that's working, I'll show you some some other things you can do via the CLI. Uh, so I just showed you the different resources. Now I'll, invo I'll invoke a command which is basically calling the Nova IP or the Nova API, and it will list the different the different instances that we've went ahead and and told our heat template to spin up. So you can see that we have a Flasky instance. You can see we have a web app instance. All, all of those were notated in the configuration that we generated. If we also want to look at network type, type things, we can jump down here. We can do a um, you know, router list, which will show us the router. VPN's a little slow. Sorry about that. Could also generate the network list, so you can see the networks. All of this I showed you in the GUI, but 
general idea. You can you can also see you know see all this information via the CLI. You can also see that all of these all of these named resources also have UUIDs, which are are specific to the to the resources. What we need to do before we can obviously uh, access our application is we need to, okay. We need to grab the floating IPs. My, uh, my mouse isn't functioning there, so let's just we'll come in here real quick. So the first thing we'll do is we'll grab the flask the Flasky IP address. Okay, that one's still loading. You can see that the the other uh, the general web app, general web app, relatively quick. If there's not an Nginx front end, there's not a database that has to spin up. But well, you can see that the, the web application came up. Uh, you know, thanks for joining the session. Definitely appreciate it. And we'll see if uh, see if our Flasky, where we're at. Now you can see that our our Flask uh, application is live. We can go to log in. We don't have a user. We don't have a user ID and password. It's a new you know new fresh application. So we'll go ahead and register. And at that point, it sends me a notification, and from there I can click to verify and start using my microblogging application. And that's, uh, I mean, that, that's the demo. Now let me just jump, jump to one, one last slide that will actually be visible. These will get posted, but what, where to go next? What, you know, what other documentation? Um, including, including some links. So uh, on the uh, DevNet site, we have a section dedicated to Cisco InterCloud Services. Definitely make sure you check it out. There's lots of, lots of useful information. Also included some links to blogs as well as the jump, the jump page for Project Shift so you can get information about Project Shift. Uh, you can also read uh, the second blog, which is the one that has open framework in the URL. Uh, that's a blog that really goes over the project shift architecture and talks about Marathon, Mesos, uh, console, what roles they play in the microservices architecture. So definitely check it out. Uh, and also in, I'm including some links so you can get started with heat templates. Uh, it's a very powerful tool. You know, I showed you a, 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 an example with one single heat template, but you can also nest heat templates and it, the, the uh, usefulness gets quite powerful. Uh, I'm right about at time, but does anyone anyone have any questions? Nope. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Uh, remember to use the QR code there for the Loot Scoot and get the activity code if you want to get some stuff over at the Loot, Loot Scoot booth. I think there's still some, some stuff left there, so uh, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, and we have some free bags in the back if you want one of those, too.
Paul, I'm your moderator. Hey, how's it going? Good, how's it going with you? Good. So I'm going to do a quick introduction for you. Okay. And then as it gets close to the end, I'll give you a 10 minute and then a five minute. Um, and if there's questions, you can run around with the mic and, and okay. help you. Okay. Looks like we have a huge crowd coming up. Here. It's definitely dying down, but you know. <laughs> Is he on? Uh, oh, I'm on, though. Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the DevNet Classroom. Uh, come on over if you want to hear us hear about uh, targeted threat defense. Sounds like a good topic. We have Dave Jones who's going to present to us today. Um, just real quick, we have, we have the QR code there with the activity codes for the Loot Scoot. The Loot Scoot booth is going to be open until 4, so Good to get a last few points in to get some stuff. You know, they still have a bunch of shirts. Uh, and we have bags, which we'll give away at the end here. Uh, also, if you haven't signed up for DevNet yet, do, uh, do it at developer.cisco.com. It's free. You can also sign up over at the help desk. Thank you. Have fun, Dave. Cool. All right, can you all hear? You all can hear me. Cool. Um, so I just want to tell you, I, I work for Cisco, but just as a disclosure, uh, I am not Cisco. I am going to say things that don't have anything to do with Cisco. and. I'm going to present these slides next week to people, and I, I'm going to do things like I'm not even going to mention the vendors that we're talking about so I can say things. And since we're here at DevNet, I mean, what's cooler? I mean, there's, there's beer right over there, and we're just best session ever, best place. So first of all, why are we here? Um, I've been through this a number of times where um, people write a really cool application, and then they go to deploy it. And it's like the, it turns out the application has to connect to some other application. And it's like, how do you connect to some other application without uh, you, you securely? Because um, one of the things I do personally, I'll get to in a minute, but is those application credentials that are used for one application to talk to another are often exploited to do bad things with your applications. So uh, why am I here? Uh, for the last two and a half, three years, I've been studying the, the practices and runbooks by the same types of people that uh, broke into Sony. Um, there's groups like uh, the Mandate Report came out, and they targeted, put together groups called APT1, APT12, they call, which are essentially uh, sections of militaries that are owned by uh, countries. And they're very well-funded adversaries, but they have a very normal way that they do things. So the uh, funny thing is, uh, just over a year ago, I was at first conference in Amsterdam, and I was going to talk about why we're here. And I said, okay, do, does anyone know about the OpenSSL incident? And it was the week that Heartbleed hit. So everyone said, yeah, Heartbleed's a big deal. Well, well, actually, that's not why I was showing this. The reason I was showing this was for a period of time last year, oh, my laser's not working. Darn it, I love the laser. Oh, well. um, for a period of time, the OpenSSL org website, which is supposed to look like that, I instead it looked like that. So. The service provider that OpenSSL is running on runs on VMware. And so what hit the media was there is a hypervisor exploit in the wild for VMware. And the, the company VMware, they took this very seriously because they thought if there is such a thing in the wild, they want to fix it. Or they want to debunk that it wasn't their problem in the first place. And the latter is actually the case. What they found out to, after looking into it was there were the service provider that was running openSSL.org, was only using username and passwords for administrator accounts to manage all their systems. So one of the administrators, and this is a recurring trend, administrators and their laptops are targeted by nation states, because administrators and their laptops have cool stuff on their laptops. They have things like scripts that can do stuff. They have administrators that log into them. And so anyway, that's, that's how this site was compromised. But I, I still just love this slide. But And with that, um, I came up with a stat last year that 5% of all system administrators or their laptops are compromised at any given time. And if you want to know how I came up with that stat, you can just ask Dave. No one asks, so I'll go on. Um, also, <laughs> well, besides phishing, phishing is a 
interesting emails that show up in your inbox. One of the ways that you get at administrator laptops, phishing emails. The other one that's popped up recently is what we call malvertising. We all go to certain websites that we trust. I was going to say CNN, but I, I, I don't really trust CNN. Um, San Jose Mercury News. You go to San Jose Mercury News, sometimes their advertisers may be one of those ones that's hosting malware, and that's one way that administrator laptops get jacked up. And I'm going to say right now, I have more slides than I have time to talk about. <laughs> so I'm going to try to go quick. But this slide, uh, Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, I can't do a slide deck without putting one of their slides up. And this one shows how over the last uh, four or five years, the main way of breaking into websites went from tampering or spyware to the number one way of breaking into stuff is stolen credentials. And on this one, this is the most recent DBIR, and they had a quote. And their quote was, well, we've tried to refrain from best practice advices here. There's no way of getting around the fact that credentials are literally the keys of the kingdom. If possible, improve them with second factor, hardware token or mobile app or monitor login activity for unusual activities. 60% uh, of the mistakes are just caused by people, was what that says. I don't know what else to say about that. OK, so let's get, in, get into this. Oh, <laughs> uh, one more thing. This one came out this year. Out of all the investigations that caused data breaches that Verizon investigated last year, 99% of them, 0.9, were for CVEs or more than a year old. If, uh, CVE is uh, when you disclose a, a, a vulnerability in an application, a common vulnerability something, exploit, um, which means that if you patched in the last year, those wouldn't have happened. OK. so. Um, Nation State Runbook. So this is how it usually happens. Um, as I was saying, a, a user is targeted, and they get some really interesting email, or they go to malvertising, and they get malware on their, their, their laptop. Oh, something called WCE, or, or Mimikatz. I prefer WCE, because it actually installs as a service. But Mimikatz is, is started. And at that point, a privileged user or privileged application, application is important today, logs through that account. And I've seen that happen with things like, say, Trend Micro goes to update DAT files. That's an example of an application connecting to a machine. Infects into other machines in the data center. And then when a real super user walks by that machine, that machine has also got a credential editor on it, steals their credentials, and then poof, you're a puppeteer. The entire data center has been compromised. Um, interesting thing about that. Uh, Flash is one of the more recent ones. I, I, actually, my list of targeted plugins is, is a little out of date. But the interesting thing about this is all of the Fortune 500 companies these days, these nation states have the, the ability to take existing malware and recompile it for your company. So uh, Google, when they send interesting malware to Google, it's going to have one antivirus signature that none of the antivirus vendors have ever seen. When Intel gets it, they're going to have a different signature. And there's some interesting things they can do with that. Like if one of those companies reports that virus back to an antivirus vendor, their hat's been tipped, and they go, ah, they found that one. Let's go to the next level. And they take it up. So infestation, remediation. <laughs> I, I don't know why I laugh at myself sometimes. I, I'm not that funny. Um, but anyway, the, the first idea is you need to use, like I was saying, multi-factors or token back to the Verizon report. So first of all, the, the super user logs in with uh, multi-factor credential, not just a password, with scoped access. We'll get back to that, that in a minute. And then the malware is not propagated through the data center. And by the way, this is some of the first animation I've ever did. And so I, I just had to point it out. I, let, I just liked it. Second, um, the privileged user application has also has scoped access and is denied access to those desktops. That's part of that scope thing. And so the malware doesn't go into, oh, and they, go, they log in through hardened endpoints. And then the malware doesn't go into the data center. And then finally, what we do is we upgrade older operating systems and, and based on and train users. By the way, I've done a lot of research over this over the last year, and I'm doing a whole talk next week, but I'm going to skip it today and how you make endpoints better for the sake of time, because I've already burned through 12 minutes. And the initial attack fails. Awesome. OK, so you may have noticed that was all about people. How do you give an application one of these? Well, I get that complaint a lot. Um, but anyway, the, the, the whole, one of the whole ideas about breaking this, this run book to put these in, 
is in the old days, like in the, the example I gave with OpenSSL, you have an administrator running with their credentials with a password, logging in from anywhere that's convenient for them, and that's how the site was compromised. So the whole idea that the breaking this run, nation state runbook is you scope that out. So you restrict how you can get to production resources from where so that their endpoint's locked out. And then you add in additional controls, like a security control point, we traditionally call these jump boxes. But the difference between a, just a jump box and a security control point, security control points have additional logging. They require a smart card. And they've been locked down in different ways. They're, they're a security control point as opposed to a jump box convenience control point. And then the, the users have their, their stuff. Anyway, that's the general concept. Um, and I just have to say, one, one of the, the best ways that we've found to detect these and stop these things is sandbox detonation. If you get a brand new, what appears to be a zero day binary that comes through your, your network, your firewall, your Juniper firewall, your Palo Alto, they are not going to see these. Even your Cisco firewall is not going to see this unless it's tied in with firepower. Uh, but things like that, what the firepower technology does, and I said I wasn't going to plug anyone, was it can actually take what looks like a binary and fire it up and do sandbox detonation on an operating system to determine what that would have done if it got into your network. So it may still hit the first person, but at that point you have discovered that, that binary that can be then applied to the rest of your folks to save them. Big deal. But the other ones, this whole monitoring thing, our CSERT team's really into it. Um, big things for us, passive DNS, NetFlow, uh, host space. Big problem for infestation is those lab machines that we all have. We have lab development machines that are sitting in closets that aren't patched because they, they're not production. No one really pays attention to them. But if you have some sort of hips or other on them, that's how we found a lot of the ways that they got into us. And when I say us, I'm talking about the entire Fortune 500. We're not special. We're just a big company. Um, but logging all those in the same place so they can be correlated is a big idea, good idea. 15 minutes. So control use cases. Um, so for the next few, I'm going to apply those concepts to a few different applications. And then I want to talk about what you can do as developers to do these same kind of things. So this first one is something we did. Uh, this is kind of Windows specific, since I said group policy object. but you, in a Windows environment, you can scope access with GPOs. The, the short thing is, administrators are locked out of desktops. You cannot use, the point of this GPO is you cannot, as an administrator credential, you can't take one of these and log into a user desktop because they can still steal your hash and then this is now irrelevant. So you keep administrators out of untrusted machines, which we call desktops and lab machines. Next thing we do is we scope out um, application control. So like I was saying, we had our antivirus update system, Central, would push out DAT files to all the different machines. It had usually a, a local administrator rights to all those machines. It didn't need that. All it needed was the ability to get to the one directory that had the DAT files it had to update. But also, those, those special administrator accounts that can do the same kind of stuff, they had to be locked out from everything besides their own systems. They can't log into Active Directory. They can't log into desktops. And finally, the Active Directory folks, we actually did a bunch of stuff here. But with these accounts, because these are the super, super accounts, the keys of the keys, I like to call them, when they log in with their hard credentials, they can't even do stuff like they do an interactive log in their machine. They can't establish outbound network connections. So their credential is limited to scope down to just the machine that they're working on. They're, so their credential can't be leveraged to do other stuff. So um, this can be applied to Puppet 2, but the, sorry, Linux 2. But the whole idea here is I call it security configuration management. Instead of just system management, it's stuff that looks for security controls that have been disabled or otherwise and puts them back. But I'm going to just gloss over this one to get to the next. Because uh, we have, uh, if you needed to take, apply this to protecting, um, say, your networking devices, you're using some company to do networking stuff, right? <laughs> it's a fair thing, <laughs> fair, fair guess. So here's the networking gear. You probably have network management infrastructure. So for the network management infrastructure that programmatically does apply things across the board, it needs to be scoped down to the accounts it can use to do stuff, but also just the which machines are allowed to connect to these devices needs to be restricted. But the other side, since this, none of the networking vendors 
that I either alluded to or didn't allude to support multi-factor. We have to give multi-factor to those vendors. So most of that support is done through SSH. So you put an um, uh, ACL filter so that SSH can only come from our security control point. And that security control point requires multi-factor. We've just given that vendor multi-factor administrative support. So if you just look at it, these are two different accounts. This account is the actual administrator. He has a, a smart card. Oh, the, sorry, the administrator has two accounts. This is their account that's tied to a smart card to get to the jump box. And then they have another account. It could be a, sh a shared enable account, if you like that kind of thing. Or this could be the RBAC account that is only used for monitoring router, or, sorry, logging into the router base. <laughs> it's really fun when I'm in a hurry, especially when I had a lot of coffee. Uh, um, this is an interesting case that I just wanted to bring up because I, I don't know what kind of applications you all develop. But we have a, a MDM, oh, my props over there. Imagine I'm holding a phone, uh, a mobile device management vendor to manage all of our devices. And that we called critical infrastructure because it could push whatever type of binaries to all of our mobile devices, so we had to protect it. In the case of this vendor, they were doing both the, the client connections and the administrative access through HTTPS, this, the same protocol. So we couldn't just put an ACL in place, block the administrative here, well, user there. So we actually had them in their application, we split up the modules. A couple hosts only ran the administrative modules, and the rest ran the client modules so we could apply the same concepts we were doing to those. I'd really like to talk about this one in depth, but I'll just talk about VMware. Um, I'm just going to uh, escape away from OpenStack. But for VMware, they, VMware also, 10, thank you. VMware also does not support multi-factor. So in order to, since VMware is really important, you can connect to ESX, and if you have the rights, you can, it's one thing in the old days, I I know about a couple servers that were physically stolen out of data centers in Israel, but that's, we noticed it. VMware, you could actually steal copies of VMs and no one noticed, a running VM and no one would notice it. So it's important to apply that, this to that as well. Um, same kind of concept, but re really quickly, in our case, we have um, a, mail appliances that run on BSD Unix that do things like um, email security appliance is one of them, runs on BSD. Same, same kind of problem, didn't have access to uh, multi-factor, so we had to give it that. But in the other case, for PowerShell scripts that are running to manage the actual mail servers, we use GPOs to restrict that those accounts are able to do that. First of all, inactive directory or the mail servers only had rights to do that. But second, there's a burden here, um, they could only run those provisioning accounts from those machines. OK, now here's the stuff I wanted to get to in the beginning. That's why I rushed through everything else. OK, so like I was saying, back in the old days, you, you created an application. And it needs to log into another application on behalf of your uh, initial user. So old school, what we would do is the credential that that machine needed to log into that machine, uh, we'd require that that was, in, say, in a file, not in code. And that file, the, the file access is rw dash 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 dash, which requires that you have to do a pseudo. The application has a pseudo to it. And that pseudo is logged, so we know whenever that account's used. One of the big problems with this scenario is any user that uses this application, the, the, the generic account that's used to talk to the other one, it has to have the rights of every one of those users in order to do whatever, say, we all have different rights. It has to be able to have the rights of all these different. So you steal that one account, everything goes bad. So w one of the things that, that we've done for these applications is we've, we've taken the credentials away from the actual machine. So, and given this machine its own credential. So in this case, this machine has a credential, it could be something like an SSH key, that it uses on behalf of the application to connect to an application vault and say, hey, I need this application's credentials. In this vault, it could be an HSM, it could be a TPM, I'll talk about what those are in a second. And it retrieves the username and password that that application would use to get to the other side. Now that is a bump up from what we just said of how that password sort of is not just in a file system somewhere, it's kind of harder to steal. And also, we've restricted on from what machines will have access to that username and password, because this vault won't hand that credential out to any machine besides that one. There's checks in place. 
But still, we had the problem of they're all, that generic account has to have the rights of all those users. So jump into a messy slide. And what we want to do here is each of these machines would have a certificate, hopefully secured well. And like I said, I'll get to that in a second. And so the machines establish a TLS encrypted tunnel between them. So that's protected. And then we introduce this IETF standard, OAuth. And OAuth's job, it was created with the idea that, um, for Flickr, actually, I could put my pictures on Flickr, and I could tell a print shop, I want you to print these 10 pictures. You can't, I don't want you to see any of my other pictures. Print those, but I don't want to give you my password. I just want to give you permission. So OAuth was actually created to do that thing. So that in this case, we have the encrypted tunnel. And then this user, as they go through this stuff, will have a user flow. So it's not a machine automated steal stuff thing. And so the user actually in a screen will accept. So you have a user giving permission so that over this encrypted tunnel, that application can get a credential that has the specific rights of that user as opposed to the rights of all the users. So this is, this is my great use case. And with five minutes left, oh, so um, certificate storage, hardware security module, that's the best. We have network-based ones now. Our PKI infrastructure that's used to print certificates for every phone that I don't see sitting around this environment. Any of our devices that do secure boot that have their own certificate and hardware, we use hardware-based HSMs to do those. The problem with HSMs is they cost about $18,000 a pop. Actually, there's some cheaper ones, but the ones we use are that much. Um, TPM chips are in, no one has one of those laptops. Oh, this laptop right here probably has a TPM chip in it. Same con and it's the same concept as a smart card, but it's actually inside the computer itself. Uh, Microsoft has launched a whole bunch of stuff with their Hello technologies so that you could store credentials in that securely and do stuff, but more on that later. But I mentioned USB here because VMware actually has the ability to, if you have your, your certificates on a USB, they have the ability to vMotion from USB physically between um, a virtual machines. And finally, if you have to, files, but we just want to get away from that. So um, I, I'm not actually pick, uh, I, I, I'm not pitching PX Grid here, but this, some friends of mine wrote it, and I happen to have a patent that's in that technology. That's the other reason I'm pitching. I'm pitching me. Actually, I'm not pitching the company. Um, but I get this complaint all the time. Uh, uh, Dave, I don't know. I know it's certificates. I have to use them. I don't know how. I don't know how to talk to the back end. I don't know how to make them work. How do I do that? Where do I click to make, give my app a certificate? Well, one thing that PXGrid is in setup is they give you the ability to add certificates. They'll even generate self-signed certificates if you want to use those. And by the way, the math is the same on a self-signed certificate as it is for a public certificate. The only difference is you, you have to be in control of your own trust. So in case anyone wants to argue that, I'll, I'll talk about it later. Um, <laughs> I got this, this is a marketing side, sorry. But the idea behind PXGrid is it's a security, mostly security play now. Uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Gillis who left the company. But the idea is you, with it is you have all these different sources for information. You have your NetFlow events, you have firewall events, you have MDM events, which is a big deal knowing whether these devices are trusted or not. And you want to share information between them all. So you, what we did in the old days was you would connect them all individually and you get this mesh of stuff that would work hit and miss and some would work or not and some things didn't work. Uh, but it, it really was, it was a fail in the end. And marketing made that animation. I, I don't get to take credit for it. Um, so what PXGrid added was the ability, one framework to do all that. And the way it does it is the same way we do um, instant message, it uses Jabber technology. So what these things do is they actually can subscribe to chat channels. Uh, does anyone do instant message besides me? OK. <laughs> all right. So you know you can set up a group chat. <laughs> So the whole group can see it. Well, the same concept's there for PXGrid. So uh, you can subscribe to the Current Threats channel. You can subscribe to the, um, the other MDM channel, Trusted Device channel. But the thing you can do as a developer, oh, <laughs> here's the th thing that tells you this. Um, the grid, they actually uses, uses PKI. So the grid controller has a root cert. And then each of the clients connecting to it would have a different cert. 
establishes the TLS tunnels for you and also will validate each of the endpoints for you and helps with discovery. So it's, it's kind of a cool concept. Oh, and you don't have to write code. So in action, like I was saying, they, I like to have architecture slides instead of marketing. So in this case, depending on what your applications are, I mean, whatever you're doing, instead of sensor or switch or uh, Firesight Management Center, it could be whatever your apps are, PX Grid can handle the secure communications between them all. Like I said, there's a client that goes into it. Saying best practice, I'm not, I'm not actually pitching it. Oh, and we don't actually make money off PX Grid either. It's, a, it's in the ITF, actually. You, you don't even have to use that product to, to be the grid controller. There's actually other products that can be a grid controller. Um, there's more information on it there. But two minutes left. Uh, another best practice I want to say, um, this is a slide I got from Ken Beck, who's in our security business group. And he created this. And this is their idea for how we're going to do SDN. And this, this slide is actually just a use case of how you could do security investigations. But if you notice, he added in my security control point to connect to these things, different devices, APIC EM, APIC DC, ICE. And then these yellow connections are actually those TLS encrypted tunnels that are managed through this, this central thing. So I just want to give them a quick plug in, in the ways how you, you should do this. So, do you have any questions? <laughs>